my name is Nathan, Nathan Ade, uh, and I am a student of the University of Derby. Um, and today we've got uh, two panelists, so I will ask them to introduce themselves and to each um, say what their name is and what their role is in one sentence, please. So uh, let's go to Jess first. Hi, I'm Jess. I'm a social prescribing link worker employed by the NHS. Um, my role is to work holistically with people looking at the wider factors which may influence somebody's health and well-being and working with them on action plans and goals to help improve that. Wonderful. And Rich? Hi, uh, my name's Richard. I work for Derbyshire Voluntary Action. I have very, very similar aims to Jess. It's just that I'm based um, with Derbyshire Voluntary Action, which is uh, third, third sector. So there are advantages to what I do and there's advantages to what Jess does. But we both try to find out what matters to people. And we're, it's this, this whole, this whole um, service is all about movement and, and people wanting to move. And we're just enablers there to help them get to where, where they want to go. OK, thank you. So uh, the first thing we will touch on is if you could both sum up what your role involves um, in no more than three minutes. Um, and so we can start with Jess, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it's really hard to condense what we do in this in this role in three minutes. Um, I guess I'll draw on what Rich has said in that we focus on what matters to that person. Um, we look at somebody from an asset based approach. So we'll look at their strengths and the things that they're passionate about and what they can do. And we draw on those to work on barriers and things which prevent them from getting them to where they want to be. And we do this by breaking things down into small manageable tricks. and we kind of set a timeline of things that they want to achieve and break it back and we go backwards um, from there. And little small goals means that people's confidence builds up and then they're able to reach the next goal and so forth. Um, so overall, the, the idea is that because of this, it improves people's quality of life, their, their health overall, their feeling of well-being. Um, so it's a really positive and really rewarding role to do. Over to you, Rich. Yes, I mean, Jess, Jess was really eloquent there. And um, uh, just to add that um, if you think about it in terms of a, a GP will offer a, a medical prescription, we can offer a social prescription. Um, and every, every goal that we set, we set action plans uh, co-produced with clients. And every goal that we uh, we work towards with a client leads to something better, something bigger. Uh, Jess alluded to it just now, but it could be uh, a client may just want to be able to open their curtains or walk down the drive and back or walk to the local shop and talk to the shopkeeper. That could be a first action. And it's fantastic to see people flourish and things, things to happen for people in a positive way. As Jess said, everything we do, um, is about positivity and looking at the uh, what people can do and not what they can't do. Um, and every goal leads to something bigger and better. And we've got case studies of examples of uh, fantastic achievements by some of our clients. Very nice and to the point answers there. Thank you. Um, we do have loads of time, so feel free to embellish on more details. Um, but the next question I'd like to ask is what personal qualities do you think you need to be a social prescribing link worker? So um, back to Jess, please. I think there's a, a kind of a, a skill setting and, and a set of qualities that you need for this kind of role. Um, you need to be somebody who's really patient, who really genuinely cares about making a difference and working with people. Um, you need to be able to be confident enough to reassure people, especially when they're scared and they're worried, because making changes is a massive thing and that involves a lot of fear. So you need to have the skills to be able to work with somebody in that kind of situation. 
Um, you also need to be really empathetic. Um, it kind of goes without saying you're going to be dealing with people who have complex mental health and physical health problems. And you need to have the ability to really relate and understand what they're going through. Um, otherwise, you're going to really struggle to, to help them to move forward. Um, in terms of skills that somebody might need, um, I would say that a lot of it is skills like motivational interviewing um, an understanding of kind of neurodiversity because you know a lot of people who really struggle may have things like autism ADHD um, but overall really it's about having that attitude of really wanting to make a difference and and the willingness to stand by the side of somebody and say I'm going to be with you on this journey and if you've got that commitment to be be there as that person then this is the kind of role for you okay nice uh, and richard um what other additional personal qualities would you add to that well, a client once said to me who um re really did change his life for the better and unlocked all his potential he said and i i, I couldn't remember this but he said um, you believed in me from day one he said um and i could see that coming across in what you were saying and uh, Jess talked about motivational interviewing and also body language, eye contact. Sometimes clients won't give you any eye contact for the first two or three visits. Uh, they might not want to say anything. And as a link worker, you can't be scared to stand too far back. Uh, let those empty uh, spaces be filled. Uh, and that, that's where you really, really uh, it's not about me going into somebody's um, home and talking to them or at them. It's about them telling me, and me absorbing that. So you can never stand too far back to listen to that and slowly, slowly get that story from them because everybody's got a story. Um, I would suggest uh, strong interpersonal skills would be really key to this role. Uh, sound knowledge of the voluntary and community uh, sector and what's happening in your area. Jess mentioned empathy, which is huge. Uh, we don't offer a hand down and we're trying to help people up here. We actually get side by side with them and we'll work our way out together that's the whole point of social prescribing you're with them all the way um reflective listening i think um, um as you've been doing nathan you you uh, you listen to somebody you really really deeply listen to them and you summarize what somebody has said and that proves to the person that you've really uh listened and taken on board what they've said patience is huge as well um yeah, and finally, I think um, I'd say organisation and planning because um, it's a fantastic job, but it does come with paperwork. So you will have case notes, you will have referrer updates, and you have to be organised with that. You know, whether it's at the start of your day or the end of your day and uh, feeding back to these multidisciplinary teams as well. So you have to have some organisational skills, but you certainly don't need any formal qualifications. I often think with this that you have these skills Anyway, most people have these skills and it's just a case of developing them to suit the role. Thank you very much. Um, it sounds like a very, um, again, another rich um, kind of kind of work to be going into that not only requires the personal skills, but also, you know, even the more kind of admin sort of stuff, you know. Um, so the next question is focused to Jess again. So Jess, you work for the NHS, um, but you also have strong links in the voluntary sector. Why is this important for the role? So it is really, really important for the role. So although I work for the NHS, um, our idea is that, you know, somebody's health is affected by so many different factors that can't be um, necessarily properly works through in a clinical setting so somebody may be going to their GP because they've got mental health problems but actually there's so many different factors which may affect somebody's mental health it may be that actually they're really lonely and isolated they don't know anybody in their community and so he's, he's working with them in that community getting them involved making them feel part of something bigger and it's that kind of thing which helps people to move forward. Because if you've got somebody and they don't leave their house and they're completely isolated, 
and I and I only took a, an NHS approach and didn't involve any anything from the voluntary sector. Ultimately, I'm never going to really be able to properly get them out of that situation. So having links with the voluntary sector is essential. The other part of our role is to help um, like set up groups and support groups for people. So that link with the voluntary sector again is important because you need to know what is out there, what things are available for your clients to attend, and also making sure that you're supporting those groups in, an, in being able to take up the, the clients who you're referring to, to them. Um, it's also about looking at the different gaps in areas. Um, so I've, I've seen in this job, you know, groups of people who are really interested in, for example, arts and crafts, but there is no arts and crafts group or any facilities in the area. So it's identifying those gaps and supporting people and trying to find voluntary services who may be keen to host things like that. So although it's important for me to be part of the NHS because I'm part of multidisciplinary teams where we can take a, a, a wider approach to somebody's health, it's also really important that we have that voluntary sector involvement as well. Um, I don't know whether you've got anything to, to add to that at all, Rich. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly with that. You're talking about gaps and um, and provision available. And yeah, I mean, luckily, in a, in a way for me, I work um, for Derbyshire Voluntary Action, which gives me all sorts of um, uh, benefits with regard to fantastic links straight into community groups. This is a very complex, ever-changing environment. Uh, when Connect2 started in 2019, for the first two weeks, I went out and I met as many community group facilitators and leaders as I could get my face out there and it, it just changes it changes all the time but I would suggest anybody who would like to get into this uh, this area to really get to know the community to see what's out there there's a lot happening just bubbling under the surface under the radar they don't really want to shout it from the rooftops they're happy with what they're doing and, and it's unearthing that and you, you'll never get that in front of a laptop you're going to have to go out into the community and, and people will know who you are and also, um, with regard to, uh, like say, a client going to a, a social group, for example, uh, you will probably meet the client there before the social group and attend for part of that. Um, then you may contact the facilitator afterwards to see how it went if you weren't there for the whole um, event. So you really need to know. You need to know who's who and you need to have contact details. And it saves, it cuts down on a lot of time. Um, just being known out there, but, but knowing who's out there. And as I say, it's an ever-changing environment and it's it's something that you have to keep on top of. But yeah, that's that's all I'd like to add to Jess's comments. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, what kind of training have you done as part of your role? So uh, back to Jess, please. Um, so I think there's a lot of different training options out there. Um, but I think also what's important is the experiences that you've had before working with people. So in terms of training, motivational interviewing training is really important. Um, kind of counselling skills, really important. Um, having training to understand the different types of people you'll be working with in terms of mental health, in terms of learning disabilities, and an understanding to some extent of the impact that people's physical health problems may have um, on their ability to do things and also on their mental health. Um, in terms of kind of wider, what I would call wider training, but really is just experience, you, re you really need to have experience working with people, with people of, from completely different backgrounds. So you may be that you've got some experience working with people with dementia, you could have then get some voluntary experience working with people with learning disabilities or youth work. He's getting that, he's working with people from a variety of different backgrounds. So you start to understand the difficulties that different people fa will face in their lives and how they can overcome that. Um, I also think that the part of it is that you kind of need to build up just the skills to be able to do a role like this because 
as Rich touched, up, touched upon earlier on, um, there is a lot of communicating with other professionals in this job. So it may well be, yes, you've got your client and you're working with them, but you may, may need to speak to social services. You may need to communicate with the GP, with the person who's referred them. It may be that you need a, a bigger approach and you've got more professionals involved. It may be that this person needs help with finances. So it's, it's knowing who those people are and it's also having the confidence and ability to reach out to those people. Um, I would say one thing which really is essential to this job is knowing what is out there in the community. If you've got a really good understanding of the different groups that are out there, the support services, just the general structure of both voluntary sector and the NHS, that is really, really valuable in this role. Thank you. Um, Richard, uh, what could you add to that? Yeah, I think with regard to training, just just touched on a lot. I mean, I, over the years, uh, I've done a lot of um, one day training in loan work, uh, dementia awareness, mental health awareness. It's always good to get onto these half day, one day training courses, which you, you can do. You can volunteer and you can do do that side by side. For me specifically, I did um, 10 weeks of formal training in 2019 with a I think an organisation was called Waypoint, and that was covering all aspects of um, social prescribing link work, and that that it was looking at mentoring, um, uh, motivational interviewing, coaching, building confidence, putting us in the position of the client, the putting us in the position of the link worker, um, having an observer. You know, it was all very um, um, it's kind of stressful, uh, but it was. It was really useful. And, and at that training, there was about 30 of us. Some were seasoned link workers and some, like myself and my colleague, were quite new to it in 2019. And it was really good to get other people's experiences um, and, and how, what, they, what they thought the role meant to them because this, this is evolving all the time, this, this area. It's, it's really good for people to want to get in at its inception. And, um, and people, you know, there's a lot of interest in it. I mean, every time you turn on you know, country file or this is look north or whatever, what I'm looking in, in my neck of the woods, there, there, there seems to be more and more discussions around social prescribing and the benefits and just the benefits generally of, um, um, you know, everything to do with social prescribing. It might be to do with um, the links into nature or something like that. But certainly, like Jess says, um, you deal with clients one-to-one, -one, so that's an ability you'll need. I worked for Derbyshire Carers for a number of, year, number of years, and I was going into people's homes and deal with them one to one. But there's the whole aspect of working with professionals like GPs, social workers, citizens advice bureau, the housing office, and having all that to hand, um, being able to coordinate that. And sometimes, yeah, you've got to go and find this information because, you know, uh, obviously things change and people leave posts. But to have as much of that to hand as you can, it's just an absolute boon to, uh, to a job like this. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just to give us a flavour of your day-to-day -day roles, can you just tell us what you did yesterday? So back to you, Jess. So every day in this job is different. Um, so yesterday morning I was with a care coordinator at one of my surgeries. I work across five GP surgeries um, and it's important to have a strong link with the care coordinators there because Quite often they work with similar patients to us um, so I was working with them in the morning. I then had some phone calls to some patients um, I then did some research so you know if you've got somebody and they're really interested in something really quite specific um, then it is looking online, it's going out into the community asking people oh what would you do about this, where would you go to find somebody who's interested in this kind of thing um, so I did quite a bit of that yesterday um, and then I'm trying to think what else I did yesterday it was <laughs> that's the thing with this job it just kind of it, you start off with a really nicely planned out day and then one thing happens and then another and, <laughs> and then another um, that's that's the nature of the job um, there is quite a bit of traveling in this job so if it's a, a career that you really want to go into then having access to a cart really is helpful. Um, I can cover 
quite a lot of miles in one day, traveling between one patient to another. Um, my catchment area is really big because I cover five surgeries. Um, so that is really, really important. There is a lot of work. For example, yesterday I went on a webinar um, which was discussing green social prescribing. So as Rich said, that it's, an, it's kind of an ever growing role and different branches are coming off. So people are really realizing the importance of getting people out into nature and the value of nature. Um, so green social prescribing is, is becoming really popular and is, um, there's kind of a lot of meetings about that and how we can incorporate that into our work. Um, there's also kind of specialist children and young people, social prescribers, um, social prescribers looking into mental health. So they're kind of specially qualified for mental health. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues that somebody can go down for this role. Um, yeah, it, it's ever evolving. Wow, sounds like a very busy kind of schedule that you can have there. <laughs> um, what about you, Richard? Is it similar for you? Uh, what were you doing yesterday? Yeah, wow. I, I wish I'd spoken first because <laughs> <laughs> Jess covered so much there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I started the day with a meeting um, and then there was a feedback, um, a feedback opportunity. Um, in the afternoon, I went to visit a client and, and from that visit, she um, she agreed a goal she wanted to uh, to achieve. So from that, like Jess said, I, I went to meet the client. It was in a neutral venue. It doesn't always have to be in somebody's home. And from there, I went away and I, uh, I went to a few uh, groups in the area and I did a bit of face to face research um with what's you know with what's happening and what's on you know as restrictions ease what's going to be happening towards the end of the month into august uh from that i went back and while it was still fresh wrote up my case notes and got um the referrer for that particular client updated with what i was doing for today so there was you know a bit of admin a bit of travel and some face-to-face -face client time so really really nice varied day thank you for that okay so the last question i want to ask is what would the next steps be for someone watching this event who might be considering um, social prescribing um, links as a career? So back to you, Jess. Um, I would say try and get as much experience as you can working with different types of people, whether that's through paid employment or voluntary work. Um, if you are at college or you're thinking of going to college or doing A-levels, it might be worth taking subjects which are around um, working with people, whether that's something like sociology, psychology, it might be something to do with social care. But that's really important because you learn a lot of skills through that, which will be useful for this role. Um, and then maybe ask, find out about work experience, shadowing a, a social prescriber. It's kind of one of those roles where you to fully understand that you need experience shadowing somebody or, or being with somebody who's who's done this role and then you fully realize the type of work that we do um, so yeah I guess to sum up I would say get some experience whether it's voluntary or not um, and work with people a variety of people um, if you are looking at qualifications there is no specific qualification for this role but um, anything to do with working with people or understanding people is a good qualification to have. And thirdly, I would say is to pretty much is to get some work experience, ask to shadow some social prescribers. Wonderful. Uh, and Richard, what would your advice be? Well, you'll, you'll need motivation. And um, I'll, I'll give you this quote that um, if you're doing something you really care about, you'll feel motivated each day. And I think you'll need motivation in, in, this, in this role because um, it's a good idea to volunteer, build up your skills, build up your knowledge and experience. And sometimes you build up your resilience as well, all, all crucial. Uh, look at local um, link worker jobs, see what they're asking for, see where you can meet the, you know, the requirements of the role, what, qual you know, what, what qual particular experience are they looking for or qualifications. Uh, contact your local VCS. Um, they've got a wealth of knowledge about areas and groups and different different areas you can get involved with. Really, really useful to contact. Um, every, every area's got one. 
Um, you can get the information on, online, just type it into Google and get yourself on some courses if you can, if you've got the capacity, even if it's an hour's course off Eventbrite or something like that, everything will build up. It's, it, it's a bit like with the clients, you know, every little step leads to something else. So you've got to be motivated and, and to push yourself with this, but it is such a rewarding job. I'd, I'd recommend it to anybody. Sorry, uh, just could you specify what VCS is just for those who aren't familiar? Oh, it's the voluntary and community sector. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, I put myself on mute there. Sorry. <laughs> We're bang on time. So thank you very much, Jess and Rich, for giving us that very valuable information. Um, and we are going to finish here. So thanks for those watching for uh, joining this event as well.